Hello, I'm J.D. Green, an extension wheat scientist with the University of Kentucky. I'm located in, uh, in Lexington, and I've been asked today to talk about a resurgence of problem weeds from the past. And to start with that, I think we need to maybe review a little bit of where we're at and where we've been. And to start to, to think about what are some of the primary weeds that are tar targeting our weed control programs of today in the last 15 years or so, here's the, what I consider the top three for us in Kentucky and, and the surrounding region, particular, particularly uh, within the Midwestern states. Things like mare's tail or horseweed, which is uh, in our no-till production systems, and then water hemp and palmer amaranth. And these are pretty much what I consider the driver weeds or a lot of herbicide programs are are revolve, revolve around trying to deal with these particular weed problems. But how do we get there? Well, if we back up even before those the, the past 10 or 15 years or so, when I drove around Kentucky, I could see a lot of soybean fields and even corn fields that had a, a excellent weed control when you got into mid to late season. Very seldom did we see many weeds above the soybean canopy, for example. And what the reason for this, I think, had a lot to do with we were in the kind of the, the peak of the Roundup Ready age, which began in the early 90s, but really peaked about mid 90s and through the early 2000, 2015, when a lot of heavy reliance was on just glyphosate for weed control, particularly in our soybean production systems. But if we think about Roundup or glyphosate uh, products, uh, somewhat the ultimate herbicide. In fact, uh, this this particular herbicide was very popular because it would control numerous plant species. It's broad spectrum activity on both grasses and broadleaf weeds with only a few exceptions to that. And it also had activity on both annual and perennial species. And combined with the, the introduction of the technology for the Roundup Ready and the Roundup Ready soy, bean, and corn technology, it really became the ultimate herbicide for grain crop production. And it's still a very important herbicide that we use today. Another benefit of Roundup or glyphosate was it has no herbicidal activity in the soil, and therefore it does not persist, causing subsequent planting of, of alternate crops. And we could use it at planting time or uh, within the, the crop season. The other critical thing to keep in mind about glyphosate, it targets a specific enzyme known as EPSP that is critical for the function of plant uh, growth and development, but it's not an enzyme that we find in, in human systems. In fact, I, to summarize all of this, there is currently no one-to-one -one replacement herbicide that's currently available or known that we can utilize that has a lot of these same properties. But as we begin to rely heavily upon glyphosate as our primary weed control program, we began to develop some issues relative to resistance uh, within plant bile types or plant populations to this particular herbicide. And as you can see, I've highlighted three of the ones that we target today here in Kentucky, and that being mare's tail, which was first uh, reported in 2001, uh, along with, with a few other states. But actually, we had a couple, some populations of both giant and common ragweed that uh, were showing some resistance to glyphosate, although those have not become a major issue for us. But the other two that have become somewhat widespread has been palmer amaranth and water hemp. And in fact, in Kentucky, these were introduced already resistant to the glyphosate uh, 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 herbicide. And we do have uh, beginning to see populations of resistance of glyphosate in our Italian ryegrass populations. But there are some other weed concerns that I think that we're beginning to see are becoming more prominent in the last few years uh, in, in our cropping situations that, that did not exist uh, in the height of this uh, Roundup Ready age in which we felt like we had the ultimate herbicide or ultimate uh, weed control program by just relying on, on one technology to uh, give us the weed control that we needed. But I think we need to back up a step and, and just think about what are some characteristics about weedy type plants that make them uh, available, to, uh, make them ability to persist and to become uh, a prominent part of the landscape. 
And the first point I have there is that they can thrive under a wide range of conditions. Um, these plants become adaptable uh, with their environment and uh, they, they can persist. They compete with the crop for desirable uh, plants for the for space, the water, the sunlight, and the nutrient needs of the crop. Uh, so once they get a little bit of a foothold, they, they, they can become quite competitive. They also have ability to reproduce. Uh, many of those plants are abundant seed producers and or can reproduce asexually uh, and or through their vegetative uh, uh, propagules, whether it be creeping roots and or uh, rhizomes, which are underground stems. Uh, many of these plants have good mechanisms for spreading. Uh, some are very conducive for spreading by the wind and or water flow. Uh, animals are a good uh, conduit for moving uh, some weed seed around whether it's attached to their to their, their uh, coat or going through the animal system uh, where they're digesting the, these uh, plants uh, seed and, and then uh, moving from point A to point B. Equipment movement. It's been one of the big ones in, with the introduction of uh, the amaranth species into, into our cropping systems. And then we've had cases of crop seed contamination where uh, the prime example I can think of is here in Kentucky, we, when uh, cottonseed holes were being used as a feed source for livestock, uh, some of those uh, cottonseed holes also had uh, some Palmer amaranth seed. Uh, that were being imported from, from some of our southern states. And then another overall characteristic about weeds, weeds is the fact that their seed dormancy. And this is quite variable, uh, which allows some of these weed seed to lay dormant for a number of years, in some cases before the conditions are, are appropriate for them to begin to germ or germinate, which leads me to another overall point about uh, realizing that a lot of our weed issues begin in the soil seed bank. Uh, once a plant becomes established in an area, the weed seed can again lay dormant for a number of years, or depending on where it might be in the soil profile, as to if it's more toward the surface, it may be more prone to germinate in a given season, whereas if it's buried a little bit deeper until it's brought to the surface, uh, but that weed seed bank can have a numerous number of different weed species. In fact, the main point here is relative to weed control, it becomes a numbers game. And the overall game plan from a good weed management strategy is to reduce the number of weed seed that's in that soil seed bank. But, but the overall, um, another major point then is that when we rely on one weed control practice, then that leads to survivability and a rapid increase in uncontrolled weed populations. And this certainly can be due to herbicide resistance or selecting for, for biotypes of plants that can survive a given herbicide, and that's the only target that that weed sees, and or just inadequate control. Maybe a weed control practice is not targeting a specific weed species uh, can lead to uh, an increase of that particular population. In fact, here's a little schematic to try to illustrate that. Uh, this is just giant ragweed, and just using the assumption that that plant, uh, on average, might produce 4,000 seed per plant in a given season. And even if we had a 10% survival rate, which is relatively low, in fact, there's some research to indicate that it could be more like 40 to 50% survival rate, uh, of some of these seed that are produced by by a given plant. But as you can see here, you know, the first year we start out with one plant that that survives. The second year, we may only may only be another 40 plants uh, in, in the field where that particular plant is beginning to, to establish itself. Even the third year, it can be uh, still, you know, about 1,600 or about 1,500 plants. When we get to the fourth year, that we have over sixty-five thousand new potential plants that are that are uh, in those that particular field. If that particular if that weed is has been unchecked for just a short, relatively short period of time, and that's where we can get these explosion in weed populations of different weeds whenever certain plants are not targeted or being selectively uh, uh, controlled or uncontrolled in a given 
in a given uh, uh, field situation. Another main thing to th think about in regards to looking at our overall weed control programs, we're often dealing with an assortment of various weed species throughout the season. In other words, we're not often we're not typically dealing with one pest or two pests in a field. We're there's an assortment of different species of weeds that that that's going to be in those given fields and again in that soil weed seed bank. In fact, if you look at some of the more common and troublesome weeds we have in corn and soybeans in our state, if we look at the broad leaves of the dicot species, as I've mentioned earlier, we do have the mare's tail and and the amaranths like Palmer amaranth and water hemp, but the predominant amaranth species we have in Kentucky is actually smooth pigweed. Uh, we have uh, both giant and common ragweed. We have uh, some different morning glory species. Uh, common cockleburr uh, is is another plant that's that's been a, been around through my whole career, uh, even before in prickly cider, uh, lamb's quarters. Uh, are weeds that you'll find often in, in many fields that uh, if it's left uncontrolled, these are the kind of weeds that you're going to see uh, germinate as annuals. And then we have a few perennial species like honeybine milkweed, trumpet creeper, and even common pokeweed uh, that can become uh, problematic in, in situations, uh, particularly under no-till production systems. And then we have some weedy grasses, things like the foxtails and the crabgrass. Uh, therefore, while we have some issues with broadleaf signal grass, which is more of a southern weed species, uh, fall panicum, as well as Johnson grass. In fact, Johnson grass was when I first started my career in the uh, in the eighties. Uh, Johnson grass was was the weed that uh, drove most weed control programs. And then we have some cases of maybe some ryegrass, annual ryegrass being problematic uh, uh, at the beginning of the season uh, in our, our no-till scenarios. So that given the fact that we have a complex of weed species to deal with, our weed management decisions can also be uh, somewhat complex. Uh, but the decisions really begin before the season starts. We need to be aware of the specific weed species of concern and understand this whole concept that, that we have multiple weed species presence in the soil seed bank that we are contending with and that we're dealing with. Oftentimes our programs are geared around, again, two or three key species of concern, but there's a mul multiple species that we need to be aware of. We need to consider the treatment options and what their effectiveness are. Uh, will they target all those weeds that are present? Uh, and then, do I need to manage certain problem weeds before they emerge, or can I handle these weeds in season? Uh, the One of the things that, the, that came about with the Roundup Ready technology was the fact that we became heavily reliant on just waiting until all the weeds emerged that can't, could come up, and then we made our applications. Um, and the complexities of what we're dealing with today uh, we are beginning to realize we've got to go back and use some of our soil residuals and deal with some of these weeds uh, as they emerge and not wait until they are already present. Also being aware that there's one herbicide program may not fit all situations. I know ideally for a producer or for a, a custom applicators or, or, a, a, or a retail outlet that does a lot of custom applications, You'd like to have just a few herbicides in in your uh, arsenal to work with in a given season. Uh, but a lot of fields, each field is different. Each field has been managed differently over time. And subsequently, we have different weed species that we're contending with in different fields. And so one herbicide program overall may not fit all situations as we would like for it to. And then along with that, do we have the resources for making timely herbicide applications? Uh, being timely with those uh, applications, whether it's uh, being able to apply it at planty time or in season, uh, are we making it the right time that's most appropriate for the weed size and the weeds uh, complex that uh, we're dealing with? So what are some of those problem weeds that we're beginning to see uh, that I'm, I consider kind of a resurgence of, of weeds that we dealt with uh, in, in past years? and are beginning to come back and, and be a little bit more common in, in uh, what we see as we get into the crop season. 
And two of the ones that come to mind immediately are things like common cockleburr and giant ragweed. Uh, again, these were two weed species that were uh, fundamentally the some weeds that we were trying to target when I first began my career uh, back in the 80s. And uh, it wasn't most most fields here in Kentucky uh, had uh, at least some cockleburr in it, and many fields even had giant ragweed, both in corn and in soybean production systems. Uh, velvet leaf was not as widespread in Kentucky as it is some states uh, to our north, but it's another uh, plant that uh, we're beginning to get questions on again. Uh, in fact, if you think about velvet leaf, common cockleburr, and common ragweed, the physical uh, growth of that plant, uh, they occupy quite a bit of, of space. And so subsequently, they occupy a lot of space. They, on a per plant basis, an individual plant can be much more competitive than let's just say a, a single grass species. But uh, uh, but those plants are certainly can compete with the crop and it doesn't take very many of them to uh, reduce yield to, due to that competition. So why are we seeing some of these broadleaf weeds? Well, yes, we still have to be conscientious that are we developing uh, herbicide resistant populations among those weed species. And I mentioned earlier, we do have some evidence that we have some glyphosate resistant uh, giant ragweed uh, here in Kentucky, but it hasn't manifested itself on a wide scale. But that is a possibility. Application timing. Um, again, weed size matters. And when we're targeting a lot of these broadleaf weeds, we're hopefully targeting uh, smaller plants uh, uh, when they're just beginning to to get a foothold in a field. And oftentimes, sometimes we may not see those weeds until they get into the crop canopy, but uh, we need to target them when they're, when they're young. But I think another possibility is the limited use of soil residual herbicides that target these larger seeded broadleaf weeds. Uh, case in point, when I look at our weed control guide here in Kentucky, and if we have a program that is centered around targeting water hemp or palmer amaranth and you can see that that many of the products we have it rated pretty high uh either an eight or a nine for control with with few exceptions for some some products but if you look across this particular table and look for other weeds like giant ragweed or even cockleburr and or velvet leaf uh you can see that our control possibilities are much much less uh, if we are relying on, on some of those herbicides that have become somewhat of our foundation for some of our weed management programs for use in soybeans as soil residuals. Some other weeds that come to mind are the morning glories. Uh, uh, there's different species of morning glories. Here's just two examples of ones we have, which is ivy leaf morning glory as well as pitted morning glory. Uh, the morning glories as a whole can be a little bit difficult to control and uh, with glyphosate, we've been able to keep it at bay, although it's not always 100% uh, effective. Um, but one of the reasons why that I, the morning work came to, to mind is this winter, I had a producer or farm manager ask me about morning glory control uh, because he had just taken a uh, some corn off to the market and he was docked 95 cents per bushel because he had morning glory seed in that lot. And you can see the morning glory seed can be somewhat uh, difficult to discriminate between uh, corn kernels. So, uh, and in this particular case, uh, this, this uh, the farm in which that, that corn came from had been in continuous corn for a number of years and relied on the same herbicide program for a few, for those years. And uh, subsequently, morning glory was becoming more and more of an issue in that particular case. Uh, the copper leaves, there's two different species of copper leaf that we uh, that we have in Kentucky. Uh, one is Virginia copper leaf and the other one's hot horn bean copper leaf. And as you can see, they're uniquely two different, uh, uh, though the same genus, they're two different, uh, uh, phenotypically, they're two different plants. Um, don't see a lot of that it's not as competitive on a per plant basis as the other ones that i mentioned earlier um, but uh, these, these the copper leaves are a little weaker to the uh, als type chemistries of herbicides uh, so they are they can be uh, 
they can get out of hand and, and become more of a more uh, problematic in some some field situations. And then bur cucumber. Um, again, this used to be a plant that we dealt with, particularly in uh, river bottom ground and and other sites uh, that had a lot of moisture. And this is a plant that yes looks like a cucumber, uh, but this particular plant has uh, a unique uh, uh, seed pods that are prickly. Uh, and it can grow several feet in a season. And the, the lack of control bur cucumber, not only does it grow several feet, and it's a viney type plant, uh, and it can wrap around corn stalks and or grow across the top of uh, uh, soybean plants and be very problematic in, in harvesting. And But I'm beginning to, to have a few more questions about dealing with bur cucumber as well. In fact, if you look at uh, some of the herbicides we have for corn, uh, this is just grouping out the uh, the pigment inhibitors or the HPPDs, uh, products like uh, mesotrione, which is Margaret's Callisto, and some other products, and a few others. You can see for burr cucumber, uh, the control can be fair at best, and then it has to be timely, because one of the other issues about burr cucumber is it can germinate throughout the season. We don't really have a peak germination time period, uh, but it can it can be a plant that actually germinates a little later in the year as well. Uh, but if we're trying to control lamb's quarters and even velvet leaf, we can do a pretty good job with this particular group of chemistry of herbicides. But as you can see, even things for like morning glory and even common ragweed, it may not be our best choice if we're targeting those specific weed species. And then just mention a few of the perennial species. Here's honey vine milkweed. Uh, it does have a milkweed type pod, but another vine, a viney type plant uh, that uh, can use at one time was a could be a pretty significant problem for us to deal with. Uh, same with trumpet creeper, uh, although it may not be as widespread, but it can get a foothold in the field. And it's not, it's coming back from the root system more often than not in our cropping situations. And then we had a, a time period with common pokeweed. Uh, was an issue as we moved away from less and less tillage uh, when we were able to, to control Johnson grass and corn uh, with some post emerge herbicides and began to be able to maintain fields in a conventional no till scenario. Then, common poke weed became more problematic. I'm not seeing a lot of these weeds because that's one of the big benefits of the Roundup Ready technology was to help us. Uh, control and reduce populations of these particular uh, perennial species. But I am running across a few fields that I notice uh, things like common pokeweed uh, that's present. But if you look at some of the weed, the herbicides and their effectiveness on these kind of perennial species, you can see the glyphosate is, is our best choice uh, for, for keeping these herbicides or these weeds at, uh, at bay. Uh, whereas dicamba and the 2,4-D products uh, can help, but uh, not not near as good. And then some other herbicide options there that uh, that might again help suppress growth, but but are not uh, going to be a, as effective as uh, relying on on uh, glyphosate. But one of the major concerning plants uh, that I'm seeing in in some of our field situations has been the the weedy grasses. In particular for us in Kentucky, uh, Johnson grass has been a, 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 like I said earlier, it's 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 been a foundation weed in the past. Uh, in the height of the Roundup Ready age, uh, there were few fields that you'd find much Johnson grass in at, towards the end of the season. But now as you drive around, you'll see these pockets of, of escaped Johnson grass plants that are showing up uh, late in the season. And if you know, to, uh, to give you a little bit of background on Johnson grass, if you're not familiar with it, it's a warm season perennial, so it really shows up later in the summer uh, under hot, hotter uh, and humid weather conditions. It can reproduce not only by seed, but also the rhizomes, and uh, both of those can be problematic. In fact, you might do a good job of reducing that rhizome population, but that seed bank can last for years, and so once it's been introduced into field, it can be quite challenging. Uh, for a number of years, and it's it's certainly one of our bigger challenges in grain crops and even in forage cropping, uh, particularly particularly hay fields. 
In fact, this past summer, I was asked to go look at a cornfield uh, here in Kentucky. It's about 40 acres or so. And this is what it looked like. And this field is, is had a massive population of Johnson grass. It looked a lot like the fields that, that I worked in when I was doing my graduate work uh, back in the early 80s. Uh, and we get these populations of heavy population of Johnson grass, and it's uh, and it can can overwhelm a, a crop and, and be quite uh, problematic. So why are we seeing more Johnson grass? And I've been kind of pondering this for about oh, five or six years or so now. Uh, why we may be starting to see more of it, and one of the possibilities is antagonism. As some of the newer technologies, the dicamba and the 2,4-D tolerant soybeans have come out, uh, we're still tank mixing glyphosate and or other ACCase herbicide, things like uh, clethodem, which is select, uh, and, and others. When we tank mix those herbicides with things like dicamba and 2,4-D, we can get antagonism or reduced activity. And thus, uh, that would allow the the Johnson grass and other weedy grasses to survive uh, in in those cases where we're doing some of this some tank mixing with these uh, these broadleaf type herbicides. I think timing might be another piece of the of the of it uh, the poor timing for herbicide applications. In the case of Johnson grass, actually an early season application when that plant is spending more of its energy to, to uh, produce top growth, we don't get as good a translocation into the root system. Whereas if we have mid to later season applications, we tend to do a better job of controlling uh, that this particular grass. And it may not be a target weed. As I said, we've had a lot of fields that just seemed like there was hardly any Johnson grass. So the population had been greatly reduced, which was a good thing. And there's been cases where a person may leave out a herbicide that target grasses. And as such, it's not a weed that's being targeted. Uh, we also have to ask the question, are we developing herbicide resistance in this, this uh, in our Johnson grass population to whether it be glyphosate and or other herbicides? And then I think an, another equation for us in our area has been crop management programs or crop programs that are relying more on non-GMO crops. What's driving it in Kentucky is the bourbon industry uh, prefers to have a non-GMO uh, corn uh, in in their uh, system. So we're trying to go back and revert and use some of the older technology, old weed control technologies, where we cannot use glyphosate as an over-the-top uh, uh, herbicide in, the, in those situations. In fact, to give you one example of a, of a case that I got involved with in 2021 initially uh, was one of these uh, large relatively large producers of grain crop producers in the state uh, were seeing poor Johnson grass control out of their their uh, foliar or top, over the top applications in corn, less so in soybeans because they had some other tools, but they relied a lot on nickel sulfuron, which is an accent uh, to control Johnson grass in corn. So I was able to, to go out and, and uh, after I was notified of that and the corn had been harvested. We did get a little bit of a regrowth, a reflush of Johnson grass and did just a kind of a quick little study just to see what kind of activity we, we could get. And as you can see, the bottom uh, photo here is Roundup or glyphosate, excellent control of the Johnson grass, whereas with Accent or Nexofuron uh, and with Assure, uh, which is Quasifop, the control was less than desirable. And this is just kind of a quick study that I did in 2021, but that followed up the following season in 2022 and looked at a 1X and a 2X rate of some various herbicides to see uh, what kind of control that we could get uh, at, at one of these sites. And again, with glyphosate, even at the 1X rate, it was basically 100% control uh, at that, even at that lower rate select max or clethodem, uh, even a 1x, 2x rate was very similar, over 90% control. It's still what would I consider acceptable for that particular herbicide chemistry, uh, and uh, we were getting good results. But then select max, which is a group one or ACCA type herbicide, 
when we compare that with another ACCase herbicide like Assure, which is Quasifob, we can see the control was less than was 30, no more than 30% even at a 2x rate. And then with Accent, the control was not much different than the check. So we are definitely seeing some problems in this particular field or in this particular area where, where this uh, crops have been relying on using uh, the, uh, the Accent, uh, the control was less than desirable. So what implications does that have for us in the future? Well, actually, we had already documented back in 2006 ALS-resistant Johnson grass, uh, basically to accent <clears throat> and other uh, ALS-type herbicides that has Johnson grass activity. So we knew we had populations already. They were pretty isolated. And, and uh, in fact, uh, when the Roundup Ready corn program uh, came along, that sort of helped to resolve the problem for, for a while. And we also knew we had some ACCase resistant Johnson grass, and particularly specifically it was to uh, fusillate or fluazifab, uh, which is a group one herbicide. That's what's that H herbicide group one herbicide. Uh, but what was unique about the, the the study that I just shared with you is that we had a difference in among the group one herbicides in the control of the Johnson grass population. We had good results with the clethodim or the select and poor results with the qualazifab um, in this particular uh, location, uh, which leads us to suspect we have a Johnson grass population resistant to both a herbicide group one and a herbicide group two herbicides. Um, and we're in the process of trying to confirm that now as to uh, indeed is that uh, uh, fully uh, resistant to both of those group, group herbicides. That being the case, do we also have maybe some glyphosate resistant Johnson grass in Kentucky? And as I've pondered that for the last few years, and we've had a number of scenarios where uh, individuals have said they've seen poor Johnson grass control, we can go to those fields and retreat them, or we can bring those plants in and readapt them and, and spray them. And we've been able to control it still with glyphosate. But there are known cases of glyphosate resistant weeds in the U.S., uh, particularly in the Delta areas in Mississippi and Arkansas, as well as in uh, West Tennessee. Uh, and there may be some other states that are reporting it as well. But my major question is, if we do start seeing glyphosate resistant Johnson grass in our state, can we rely on the other class of herbicides, particularly the, the, uh, the group one herbicides, uh, as well as a group two herbicides to help us control this weed. And if we don't, and we have glyphosate resistance as well, then we could see again the explosion of weeds like Johnson grass. Another situation I was asked to look at uh, this summer, uh, and I was, was told before I made the site visit that uh, the farm was, again, a non-GMO corn uh, situation, a different uh, geography within the state. And uh, there, here's what the plants look like uh, that came up. And they were assuming it was Johnson grass. And if you look at, take a quick look at the plant, you could also say that this looks like potentially Johnson grass plant in its earlier seedling stages. You pull back the leaf and look at the ligule, and that's a little bit different than Johnson grass. In fact, we dug up some plants and we couldn't find any rhizomes. And later in the season, when it produces seed heads, this is what the seed heads look at, look like. What we were dealing with in that particular field was fall panicum. And it has been years since I had seen or been had concerns about fall panicum. Um, so in this particular case, uh, and I'm sure it just, you know, relying on one one primary program, they were allowing this, this grass to... Uh, to get a foothold and it was a pretty pretty heavy population of fall panicum in that particular field and if you again look at uh, our control options for for grass control in corn as a post foliar applications at glyphosate or roundup down at the bottom excellent control you could expect for any of these annual grasses including seedling johnson grass whereas if you're looking at for fall panicum control out of accent again or uh, impact or some of our uh, other chemistries, uh, you can see we have poor to fair results at best. 
for trying to tackle weeds like fall panicum. It's a post-emergence uh, program. In fact, if you're dealing with annual grasses, things like the foxtails, crabgrass, and so forth, including fall panicum, our best control strategy and best long uh, season long control was to start with a good soil residual, uh, whether it being in corn and or soybeans, uh, metolachlor would be products that, that contain dual acetochlor as, as things like uh, worn or harness and corn, and pyroxysulfone is uh, a zidua, uh, and then we can use Outlook or dimethamid in, uh, in corn. Uh, but that's where the foundation needs to start to deal with some of those summer annual grasses. So kind of wrap up here, uh, we talk about our herbicide programs. Uh, it's important to know your key weed problems. Uh, certainly there are certain species that are going to be more of a driver in making our decisions about a weed control program. Uh, are the presence of herbicide resistant weed biotypes? But we need to also target multiple weed species and not be, uh, don't forget there are other weeds uh, species that are present in a given field. Along with it, it's important to know your herbicides. What are their active ingredients or their sites of activity? Uh, do they have activity you know, just to the foliage or soil active or both? Uh, keep in mind there's one herbicide program may not fit all situations. And then when we're talking about herbicides, we've got to be conscious of the environmental uh, exposure uh, due to sensitive vegetation, uh, potential volatility losses and or runoff to soil water, uh, all part of the equation of, of trying to select the herbicide or herbicides that, that best fit our situation. And then applying them at the right time or the right amount at the appropriate rates. Um, and uh, that comes with the carrier vials, volume and uh, nozzles and, and so forth. So to wrap up uh, overall, uh, in developing weed control programs, uh, keep in mind that an effective soil residual program greatly reduces the weed species and the population or the density of the weeds that we may need to treat as a post-emergence treatment. Uh, again, it kind of helps mix up the different modes of action, different sites of actions that we, we are using. Uh, again, what's all about reducing the selection pressure for weed resistance and or uh, lack of control of, of given species because we picked the wrong uh, wrong herbicides for a given situation. Timing, uh, I always emphasize this in presentations that I give about being aware of the weed sizes. Uh, and of course, we've got to keep in mind the crop growth stages that are most conducive for, uh, that are best suited for the, for the herbicide treatments that we're using. And then as I, alluded to earlier, it's the soil weed seed bank is is what we're we're trying to play that numbers game to avoid weed escapes that that uh, over time and it just, sometimes it's a very short period of time that we can not notice a weed problem and then within three to four years we can be an explosion of that species that we have to deal with. So thank you for your uh listening and uh, hopefully it gives you some, some thoughts and tips on how to best deal with uh, or develop an overall weed management program that targets uh, whether we're dealing with resistant weeds and or weeds that are just being escaped because we're not using the right herbicide or weed control program to, to focus on those weeds.